You have the handouts? Everybody got the handouts? Yep, okay. So, um, here's the summary in the front, and then we'll, we're going to jump around a little bit in the interest of time. Last lesson we learned about the Old Testament, Jesus said that the law, the prophets, and the Psalms were all about him. Um, I tried to give you at least four, five examples of that with the Psalms today in the sermon. That was a little bit of a lead up for next week, but so it is. All right, so you heard all these Psalms that are like, oh, I see. Huh. They were doing exactly what they were taught to do. Crying, Arise, O sleeper. <laughs> right? Uh, the, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms are the, what we call the Old Testament. We get that from Paul. Today we're going to learn about the law. All right, when we hear the word law, we think about laws that we should keep. Right? That's probably true, right? Um, I heard, uh, heard a conversation about this. Uh, I don't remember who the organization is, but they used an algorithm to find, using like law language, to find the number of laws that are run by, that the federal government has instituted. It's over 5,000. How could you possibly know if you've broken the law? Just ask the January 6th defendants. They're like, that was a law? There was no fence. We're not allowed to go into the people's house? No, it's just called the people's house. You don't get to go in. What? We can charge you with all sorts of things that you didn't even know existed. All right. So that's the problem. Um, but laws that we should keep, right? And then when there's laws, hopefully the laws are written in a flexible enough way that then you can have governors and presidents write executive orders to tell you how to use those laws. And that can change depending on who's running the show. All right. So that's the nature of law. Uh, we obey laws about stop signs and crosswalks, maybe. We obey, or railroad crossing. We obey laws about walking on private property. Maybe, maybe not. Our parents obey laws about taxes and driving. <laughs> wow, we're doing real good on this one. All right, I failed. What? Oh, never mind. But the Bible means something different by the word law. In the Bible, the Hebrew word for law is Torah. Anybody heard that? Torah? Okay, a few of you. All right, we're going to learn about it today. The Torah um, can mean a couple of different things. So it, it includes the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Sometimes called the Pentateuch, right? The five books in Greek. Um, but it's the Torah. So when Jesus says the law, sometimes he means it very narrowly. Sometimes he means it more broadly speaking, right? So we're going to say that law or Torah has kind of three, three meanings. So we're going to go really wide and we're going to get more narrow. Got it? All right, so wide, wide is laws. And then more narrow than that would be the books of Moses, Right? And what's more narrow than that? When you say the law, how about the Ten Commandments? Oh, now you're getting it. And then Jesus said, said what's the greatest commandment? And then he gets it even narrower yet. The law is faith toward God, love toward neighbor. That's the law. Or love for God and love your neighbor as yourself. Right? So we'll just say love. Oops. Don't think of love as a law. All right, but there you go. So Torah, today we're talking about this, the books of Moses. Right? So you, you have to kind of look at context to know which law they're talking about. Right? Does that make sense? Same, the same thing's true with gospel, right? Gospel, we'll just do that for the sake of argument. All right, gospel can mean good news. That's the broadest meaning, right? Just good news, gospel, God's spell, God's good news. It can mean the, yeah, the four books, right? Oops, not five, unless you count Acts, but anyway. Four books, right, of the Gospels. We call those the Gospels. All right, even more narrow would be, more narrowly speaking, <laughs> Christ died for you to forgive your sins. Yeah. That's the good news, right? But I mean, broadly speaking, it, it can't just mean good news, right? There's all sorts of gospel words that God gives you, right? I'm going to protect you. I'm going to save you. I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to, da, da, da. But narrow, the most narrow definition is for God so loved the world, you know, the gospel in a nutshell thing, right? 
as they call it. Nutshell, meaning the smallest, right? Yeah, and love. Everybody following that? Yeah, so again, it's contextual. It depends on where it's used. Today we're talking about the Torah as in um, the five, first five books. Yeah, just throw stuff at her. That's fine. In the Torah, we learn many stories about God and his people. We learn how God created Adam and Eve. We learn about how God called Abraham. We also learn stories of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We also learn about how God saved his people from Egypt through Moses. We learn how God led his people through the wilderness to the promised land. You heard about Pharaoh today, right, at the end? In the Torah, we also learn the Ten Commandments, and we learn how we should love God and love our neighbor. See? Got it. In the Torah, let's see, we also learn how to worship the Lord. God told his people how to worship him. No do-it-yourself worship. Sorry, guys. He taught them how to build the tabernacle, how to sacrifice animals, and how the priests should dress. So we see that the Torah is so much more than about laws. It teaches God's people about everything. Or a famous book, Life, the Universe, and Everything, by an atheist, but oh well. And the answer is not God, it's 42. But nobody knows what I'm referring to, probably. Nobody read Douglas Adams? You read Douglas Adams? It's on the shelves, read it. All right. It's very insightful, actually. He's one of those intelligent um, atheists. He's denied God because, it, because of reason, right? Rather than just because he just doesn't want to. Um, so he provides some insight then so you can understand what's going on in, in the head. So it says, we're not going to do this, but uh, I think you can get the idea. So we have four categories. Stories about God and his people. Laws about loving God. Laws, laws about loving neighbors. Laws about how to worship the Lord. And, right? and then it wants us to look them all up and match them up. But in the interest of time, we're not going to do that. All right. But those categories are important to remember. Um, I mean, I, I've said this, I said this in the morning prayer, I think, this week at one point, maybe twice. I tend to say the same thing repeatedly. Hopefully you don't mind. Mostly because I forgot if I said it before. Um, and it's whatever I'm kind of churning through my head, you know. So if you, have, if you never notice that, pastor tends to be on like a theme for a little bit and then... You know, like Wednesday night's sermon was kind of similar to last Sunday's sermon, but different, different perspective on the same idea. All right, so that happens. Uh, but the point was, is to say, oh, the book of Leviticus is full of gospel. It's a gospel book. It has good news all over it. And you're like, I haven't even read Leviticus because it's so weird. Uh-huh. You we, did know, we did a Bible study on it. There you go. I did find it. I do have recordings of it, but I, it's not posted anywhere, so I should... I should post it on my own personal website where I have a bunch of Bible studies you can go and watch. Dorothy, Dorothy don't touch the stuff. That's my, that's my recording. I don't want you to break the recording. Don't break the recording. All right. I know it's not a good place to put it. There's nowhere good to put anything. How about I just pick you up? <laughs> now you can play with the things in my pocket. All right. And the cords. Oh, this is not going to go well. Nope. <laughs> Call that like supervise this child. <laughs> Give her to Gus. Maybe Gus wants to play with her. Okay. So um, let's, let's kind of work through, though, the five books. So if, you got, if you've got a Bible, you can do that. If you know the Bibles, you can probably handle it, right? But think broadly speaking. The book of... Um, so we're going to go through these, these five. The book of Genesis, all right? Genesis is the, okay, the book teaches about creation. What are some other things that it teaches about? Where does Genesis end? If you've got a Bible, you can flip to the end of Genesis. Chapter 50 is with, the last like eight chapters are all about, they're about Joseph. Yeah, those are the Joseph narratives. So the end, Moses is, Who's at the end? No, Moses isn't dead yet at the end, is he? Or did he die towards the end, didn't he? Death of Joseph, Death of Joseph is at the end of, of Genesis. Birth is Mo- yeah, Moses comes next. All right. So Genesis takes you from creation all the way through to Joseph and the people in, they're in Egypt, everything's hunky-dory. Yeah, that's the technical term, highly theological term. Well, I mean, they're fed, they're well provided for, they got the land of Goshen, they got sheep and stuff, everything's great. All right. And then we pick up in Exodus... Next book. Things aren't so great after all. We're, yeah, bless you. A few hundred years later, and what's happened now? 
What's that? Yeah, they're under, they're under Pharaoh's thumb. The Pharaohs have forgotten Joseph. They've forgotten the kindness that God had shown to them through Joseph. Right? Because remember, he pre- and now they're afraid of the Jewish people, right? They're a threat to them. Why? Because there's so many. Which, by the way, your government's afraid of you too for the same reason. Right? And the, right? They do, they'll do anything they can to make you feel like you're alone and that there's no one like you, with you. And that no one agrees with you and nobody believes with you. That's why they didn't let you go to church for a while. Because they didn't want you to say, hey, maybe this isn't a pandemic. As long as you're isolated and alone and they're feeding you what to believe. See how that works? Yep, it's true. Um, so they don't want you to gather with other people in person. They'd like you to use social media. It works really well for steering people in the direction you want to go. Because they just control what you see. Right? Right? So, you know, you only see probably a third, if you're on Facebook, for example, you only see like a third of the things I post, maybe, at the most. There was a meme on Facebook saying that people think that the most washed part of your body was your hands, but it was really your brain. Ah, (laughs) nice. Well said. I like it. Good delivery, Don. I like it. It's hard to communicate a meme without the actual meme. Yeah, right. Uh, All right, so we're in Exodus. Yeah, things aren't going well. God's going to deliver his people by way of Moses, right? So you have have the Exodus that takes you from Egypt all the way through to finally to the gates of the promised land. Do they get to go in to the promised land in Exodus? Go to the very end. Somebody, you said, Bobby said no. Yeah. No, they're up to the gates. Remember they had to wander for 40 years because they didn't want to go in? How strange. Sin makes you stupid. That's what Luther says in Genesis lectures. How stupid do you have to be? God's like, here, land flowing with milk and honey. All your enemies will be defeated before you. I'm going to, the angel of the Lord is going to go before you. Everything's going to be, it's all yours. I've, I've prepared it for you. It was yours before anyway. It was Abraham's land. And now I'm giving it back, right? And they're like, no, we don't want to go in there because it's scary. Those people are mean. There's lots of them. Blah, blah, blah. Excuse, excuse, excuses. And God's like, no, I'm going to save you. But it doesn't make sense to us. How is, how is that possible? Yeah. Anyway, so then they have to wander. And the only people who get to go into the promised land are? Their kids. Yep, yeah, the children. Yeah, no one born during the exile, born in Egypt or born during the ex- No, nobody born in Egypt gets to go in. Right? Only the people born since they were delivered. All right. So, yeah, so where does that take us? Where are we next to? Let's see. Da, da, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, right? So now we're, we're going back into the middle of Exodus and we're going to expand on a section in the middle of Exodus, which is the giving of the law, the giving of the law right? Um, by law, we mean it as broadly speaking as possible, right? So there's different categories. There's ceremonial law. There's civil law, law for the state, right? And then also um, religious laws, Right? Laws about faith. Right? Those are the three categories. Uh, we have the same categories, by the way. And, and it's, it always is important for us to distinguish them if we're going to talk about Leviticus, which we're not, but we are, because I can't help myself. Um, that would be that there is the institution. All right? That's, that's the, that comes from the word, right? Like, what does Jesus say? Then there are, there are rites, all right, and then there's ceremonies. We don't have to do this right now, but think about this. Oh, no. No, wake up, wake up. Oh, too late. <laughs> Wrong finger. There we go. All right. There, there are the institution, right? So go and make disciples by baptizing and teaching them. Jesus said to do it. There's no question that that's what the church is supposed to be doing. Preaching, teaching, baptizing. He says, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Well, actually, that's Paul, but whatever. Apostolic. He's quoting Jesus. Do it, right? Celebrate the sacrament, which we do. Um, anything else? Correct sin, right? Confession, absolution. If you want to know what the institution is, just look at the small catechism. The six chief parts, right? These are the things that Jesus said. Here's, here's what it means to be a Christian. Ten Commandments, Creed, Prayer, Lord's Supper, Baptism, absolution, right? Okay. Then there are the rites. The rites, these are usually uh, traditions, like old traditions. Sometimes apostolic, right? So rites and rituals, we have a lot of those. I'm trying to think, what would be one? Is it these, sometimes these categories are a little bit hard to kind of nuance. 
Oh, this, this would be like the liturgy, right? Where, where God's Word is, is, surrounds the institution um, to provide the framework for understanding the institution, right? So think about it. I mean, if you look at the liturgy, nice with the new hymnal, on the right-hand column, if you open the hymnal, you'll see all the Scripture passages. Everything is either from Scripture, reflecting upon Scripture, right? If you look at the intro, it you can see where it's taken from, right? That's the ritual. Ceremony is all the nice things that you like to do because that's what you like to do, right? And maybe they teach, maybe they're good, maybe they're not, but this would include, she doesn't like what you're doing to her. Dorothy, you're disrupting class. Yeah, that's right, I'm talking to you. Oh, you're tired. I get it. Luke's going to walk you around. It'll be fun. I'm going to tell you, Luke, what to do. It's a law. All right, so ceremonies, things like bowing, sitting, standing, folding your hands, opening your hands, looking to heaven, looking down at the floor, I don't, whatever. Um, like walking up to the altar, kneeling at a table, being, being admitted, being dismissed. Think of all the ceremonies that we have. Right? And somebody who isn't like a part of our fellowship or, has, or one of our sister congregations, they walk in and they're like, what is the weird stuff that you're doing? Right? And most of what they're going to pay attention to are the ceremonies. They don't notice that everything's surrounding God, God's word and it's all for the purpose of delivering the institutions. All right? So Leviticus does that too. Right? But it also has uh, civil law and personal law. Right? So think laws about strangers and, uh, or foreigners. Um, laws about... Well, there's no kings or queens at this point, so you don't have the same kind of civil estate. Uh, but it's about tribes. It's more about tribes. So it's close, the closest thing you see to a nation is a tribe in, the, in Leviticus. All right, so Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Numbers. All right, where do we start in numbers? Yeah, if you have a Bible, you can jump there. You'll see. I'm guessing that numbers... What are we numbering anyway? Yeah, the census. It's not a census. Genealogy. Because those names weren't on the books. They were just the five books. How do we start off there, Don? You got some headings in your Bible. It probably tells you. Uh, chapter 1 is the census. The cen- oh, look at that. Good guess. <laughs> Keep going. Who, who's our, who we meet here at the beginning of Numbers? Who are some main characters? Anybody can tell me. We got Moses, right? Where are we? Yeah, so we're, we're going backwards a little bit again. We got a little bit more of Exodus, right? The same story, but from now from a different perspective, right? Yeah, where does Numbers end? Probably the same place as Exodus, right? Or not? Not everybody has a Bible. Sorry. Inheritance of Zelethahed's daughter. Oh, that's helpful. Everybody, everybody knows that character. Go back a little bit. What's before that? I suppose I could be doing this. I have a fancy gadget here. Boundaries of Canaan. Yep. For the Levites. Yep. Cities of refuge. Right. So we're setting up, setting up the civilization there. All right. Yeah, isn't that interesting? They haven't entered yet, yeah, so it's given. Yeah, I don't think they've entered. All right, let's see. Numbers chapter 36. Let's go there. Go. So it's more rules, huh? Cities of refuge. Leaders appointed to divide the land. He's spoken, speaking to Moses. This is all before they go in. Yep. Yep, that's right. And it's all Moses. Yep, and the boundaries, the land, co- the instructions for conquest, right? None of this actually happens because they refuse to do it yep, until later. All right, then we get to Deuteronomy, which just means Deutero, just means again. Sorry, I'm scrolling fast there. It just means again, and nomos is the Greek, or excuse, yeah, it's the Greek word for law. So it's the law again. In case you didn't get it the last time, we're going to go back and we're going to retell parts of Exodus, a lot of the Levitical law, a lot from what's numbers, and we're going to tell it again. Right? So repetition is the mother of learning, and Moses can't help himself but repeat himself. All right? So we have Deuteronomy. It starts with 
again, the instructions to go in, the tribal leaders, but we pick up where we left off with numbers and they refuse to go in, all right? So then we've got, it's all this, it's really all the wandering, isn't it? The desert years, yeah. Okay, so that, that's the broad summary there. There are, like we've experienced here recently in the daily prayer, um, you've, no, you've noticed that we jump back and forth between Chronicles and Kings. It's the same idea. The Chronicler is later, and, but he, they, he tells a little bit different perspective and a little different story. Right? He expands some parts and he compresses other parts. You know, you've noticed as we've read through this week, he often says, hey, for the rest of the stuff that happens with this king, go read, go read the other books. <laughs> right? So these are the things that I needed to tell you um, that maybe we're missing or just wanted to expand upon. Um, and I would suggest to you the chronicler is trying to do it um, theologic, more theologically. He's, trying to, he's, he's doing it more like preaching. So here's the purpose of this or that. Right? So there you go. Moses dies on Mount Nebo. So Moses dies. Then we get Joshua, that's, but we're not talking about Joshua today. All right, got it? So there's your broad, broad strokes. So it gets us from creation all the way through. We've got Noah and the flood. We've got all the, we've got everything that happens until Joshua goes in. Joshua is ready to go into the promised land. Moses is dead. All right. So that's the, like the early history of the of um, God's people. What's interesting about that is it really is the primary story or framework that the New Testament uses. All right. They'll cite prophets. They'll quote Psalms, um, but more often the New Testament is referring to the Torah. There's so much quotation and reference to the events of the Torah. Although today, I mean, I think you could see a lot of striking similarities with Jonah and and Jesus, right? Yeah, so so there are some prophetic connections there too, but especially the Torah. And and the reason for that is um, the the books of Moses, the first five books, the Pentateuch, the Torah, these were the stories that people told their children. All right? So that's why you would tell, that they would memorize it, the, the men would memorize it and pass it along until it's recorded. It's not recorded until, probably not recorded until Egypt, any of Genesis. Egypt, of course, was papyri and they were quite good at, at manufacturing books and scrolls and things. Well, scrolls, not books at that point. All right? So it had been an oral transmission, it had been passed along, um, like the stories you tell. I don't know. You probably have stories about your family. I come from a f- storytelling tradition. Well, at least my mother. Being a librarian, she, re- you know, she likes to tell stories. Yeah. She likes me when I refer to her on the video or audio. Okay, maybe. I don't know. Um, so everything. Now, uh, we talked about this last week, but we should recap. All of that, all of it, from, from the very act of creation all the way through to the entrance to being ready to enter into the promised land, all of that tells us of Christ. It speaks of Christ. It's our history as much as it is their history. All right? So um, we can't really understand, and, I, and I've only began, I've only begun now, how old am I? I'm old enough, um, to, to start to even appreciate even just how, how many, how much what happened to the people of God in the past tells us of who we are in Christ today. Right, so I try to expand that for you each day in the daily prayer, but um, you, know, you can't even plumb the depths of the way that the, these stories, which are written by many authors over a span of thousands of years, um, but all inspired by the Holy Spirit, are woven together into this, this lovely, um, what Jordan Peterson called on Joe Rogan, um, a library, like the first library. I think that's helpful. It's not one book. It's a library of books. A collection of books. Not only is it the first book, but it's the first collection of books too. And it ends up then um, having incredible effect upon well, the world, really. And we don't want to lose sight of that. And that's somebody who doesn't even necessarily believe it's for him. So, you know, in a faith way. All right, let's look at uh, Matthew 5. We've just got a few verses here to read. All right, Matthew, f- or, yeah, this is at the Sermon on the Mount, right? So, Oh, that, by the way, oh, I mentioned the Jordan Peterson. I should, I should share that clip somewhere for you because he actually talks about, um, in, talks about it on this interview. Jordan Peterson's a Canadian philosopher. But he has some lovely lectures on, on Genesis that he did where he reads it not as a believer, but as um, basically as like a grand story uh, that, that actually informs a lot of, well, informs reality and tells us who we are and 
how this world has been structured and which it is that too, right? So that's pretty helpful. Uh, but he mentions that, um, maybe this is where I heard it. Yeah, I'm pretty sure this is where I heard it. That people read the Sermon on the Mount separately from the Old Testament. So we, you read it and then, then, oh no, I know where I heard it. It was on um, another show. I can't give you too many things to go listen to, right? It's hard enough to listen to, you know, 30 or 40 minutes with me every day. So, um, what was I going to say about this? Oh, that we read the Sermon on the Mount as if Jesus is contradicting the Old Testament or he's setting it aside, right? So the language, for example, of um, you shall not murder. You've heard it said in days of old, you shall not murder. But I say unto you, anybody who's angry with his brother has already murdered him in his heart, right? And there are those who would say, well, now Jesus is contradicting the law. The law was not murder and he just made it something completely different. That's not what the but means in that sentence. You have heard it said, you shall not murder. And in addition to that, I say to you, this is what murder means. Right? So he's actually expositing on the law. Right? And then you can see all the ways that people have been murdering the whole time, even though they weren't necessarily you know, Cain killing Abel, but there's plenty of hatred. There's plenty of calling people names. <laughs> there's plenty of you know, hurting people's uh, livelihood. So anyway, uh, where were we? Five or 17. There we go. Do not think that I came to destroy the law and the prophets. I mean, he even says it in the Sermon on the Mount. (laughs) Don't listen to what I mean. When you're listening to me, don't hear it this way, that I'm trying to destroy the law and the prophets, okay? I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, or I like the old way, truly, truly, right? Till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one, one tittle, will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. All right. It's a pretty complicated statement, I think. Um, By the way, a jot and a tittle, you know what those are? I mean, we can use English letters for this. That's the jot right there. And then that's that's the tittle. (laughs) Yeah, it's whoever did King James, whoever translated it. It wasn't King James, by the way. Yeah, exactly. So stroke or letter. So you have a stroke or letter, little, little letter, dots, periods. It just means those little things that you put on the letters. If it, when Jesus is speaking, he's thinking of, in Hebrew, there's, little letter, there's a letter that looks like that. <laughs> well, I didn't draw it very well. Sorry. Like that. Anyway. Yeah. None of that stuff can go away. Why? Because it changes it. It's no longer the law if, if you soften it you make it easier, if you change it a little bit, right? Well, it's not murder if, right? You know how people do this. We all do this. We're really good at this. It's not stealing if it's taxation. Well, sorry, that's a bad example. (laughs) Taxation is theft. Um, Well, as I said to someone, you use the government's money, don't be surprised when they want it back. Yeah. There's an easy solution to this problem. It just takes a little courage to say we're just not going to use it. We're going to use something else. Oh, you can't do that. Why not? <laughs> well, blah, 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 huffing and puffing. Yeah, well, I know states can't establish their own currency. That's prohibited by, the, by federal law. But it doesn't say that people can use other things to transact. Yeah, why not? People do this all the time. They barter for things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fur traders, yeah. It's part of our tradition. It's just weird that we just kind of like, oh, we have to use this Federal Reserve currency. That's not even a government agency. It's not even owned by the federal government. It's an independent, privately owned bank. J.P. Morgan Chase owns most of the Federal Reserve. Your bank owns most of the Federal Reserve. Like, it's not even it's not even government money. It's private money (laughs) that the government endorses. Uh, Anyway, let's not talk about that. Um, Stealing. All right. So Jesus said, I did not come to destroy the law and prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to, there's the key word. Yeah, fulfill. Now that's a weird word, isn't it? I don't know. What do you think that means? Yeah, fulfill. So to finish. Okay, not bad. Anything else? To complete. I like it. Fulfill, complete, right? Yeah. Um, look at the definition here. It's, the, the stem is play ro, uh, ro, ooh, 
sorry, pleroou, you like Greek's fun, right? Um, so the first definition here is to make full, right? So you can think of it the other way. It's not that he completes and he finishes, but that you can't understand the law and the prophets until Jesus comes. Jesus fills the Old Testament with its meaning. Ah, you see how that works, right? So the so same thing happens at the baptism in the Jordan. Jesus is baptized in the Jordan. John's like, no, I need to be baptized by you. Not, I, don't, I shouldn't baptize you. You need to baptize me. And Jesus says something very curious to him, and John gets it. He uses the same word. It is fitting for us now to fulfill all righteousness. And it's that meaning. It's that understanding. And John gets it. That now, by my baptism, I'm going to give all those baptisms that you've been doing meaning. Right? I'm going to put my forgiveness in all of them. From the, all, the adoption of sons and daughters of the king. All of that gets put back into John's baptism, which he was doing, pointing forward to Christ. See? So it's a little bit, that's a different direction than you think of, right? It's not like it's completed, ended, and now you set it aside. It's that the law has, now has its, we, have a, we understand even all of history, Genesis, Exodus, you know, all that historical data. We understand that now as testifying of Christ. Christ is the one who actually shows us what that was all about. Some of the evangelists get this really well. I'll give you an example. Uh, next week is Transfiguration Sunday, right? You agree? Good. <laughs> yep. I only say that because there's, if you use the one-year cycle of readings, we use a three-year cycle in our daily prayer and one year in church. Other people use one year for daily prayer and they use three years in church. No, it's just whichever way you want to go. But this is one of the places where they diverge. They keep going on Epiphany for three more weeks and then do Transfiguration. We do Transfiguration and then we have three weird Sundays called the Gesimus. And I'll explain it to you. I've explained it before. I can explain it again if you want. Yeah, Rip and Dust, one or three? Yeah, they do the three. So if you wonder why you're celebrating transfiguration and nobody else is, that's the reason. Because I'm one of these weirdos that use it. It's actually, it's probably like 30, I think, 30, 40% of Missouri Synod churches use the one-year cycle like we do. It's gone up quite a bit over the last, well, since I started being a pastor. That's because I promote it and I tell people, no, I don't, it's not my fault. Um, okay, so to fill up with, was there other definitions? Yeah, it's to fill with, to make full, complete, right? To pay in full, to make up. There's all sorts of different definitions. Like the vessel was full, right, to pour wine into. Or the, the length of the road comes in full to this number, which is an interesting definition. Right, so it's a couple different things there. Um, what were we talking about? Where was I going to go? Oh, transfiguration, right? So um, I, we should probably just go there because I'm not going to remember exactly how Jesus says it. But he's, it, it's not clear in English, but it's, it's Luke again. It's doing like instead of Luke, Luke. Why did you break my tablet? <laughs> Luke 17. All right, there. Uh, is it 17? No, it's 7, isn't it? Where's the transfiguration in Luke's gospel? Somebody find it. I'm going really fast. We're not, I went past it. Oh, it's chapter 9. Sorry. Why do I know that? I had a professor that made me memorize it. I think it's chapter 9. Yep, there. We're getting closer. No, it isn't 9. Yeah, it is. Look at that. 928. Ha ha! I win. It's also Mark 9. Confusing enough. Now look at this. You're not going to see it. All right, look at verse 30, 31. See that right in the middle? This is only in Luke, but Luke gets it. And he's doing exactly what we're talking about right here. And behold, two men, were talk men talked with him, of all people, Moses and Elijah. All right. The law and the prophets. prophets. Good, okay. Who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease which was about to he was about to accomplish at jerusalem all right anybody have a different translation departure, departure? all right anybody else yours says departure all right here's the thing even king james here had a new king james had a little problem with that word they're like i don't know how to translate that come on highlight it let me highlight it i want it to pop up for you so you can see the greek oh why isn't it uh, no, it's broken. It doesn't, it's, it's still Luke's fault. 
All right. Well, anyway, the word there is, in Greek, exodos. Does that sound familiar? Exodos. What's the, that's the name of a book. Exodus. Yeah. It's to go, it, hodos is the way. So exodos is to go out, to go, to depart. Wow. Oh. Exit. exit. Yeah, this is exit music here. No, I mean, he's talking to them about his, his exodus, which he's about to accomplish in Jerusalem. So you see how, uh, maybe you don't see, maybe I should preach this next week. He's, he's backfilling in what the purpose of the Exodus is. It's Jesus going into exile, suffering and death, being, and, then, and, you, and taking his people like Moses and bringing them out of sin, slavery to sin, death and the devil, and bringing them through into the promised land, his kingdom. By way of water, through the Red Sea. You see? So the Red Sea is a picture of bat is the is actually teaching us about baptism. That's the reason for it. Same thing as going through the Jordan River. They did that to teach us about our baptism. I know you think of it the other way. Well, we're baptized like they went through the Red Sea. No, it's the other way around. They we're baptized. They I don't know how to say it the other way around. They were baptized to, or they were baptized in the water. <laughs> That's how the apostle says it. They see, they, he, it actually, the apostle, I think it's Peter, says that he was, we were baptized in the, they were baptized in the sea. He actually uses the word baptized, right? Because he understands this too, right? So those stories were told, those things happened to teach us about who we are in Christ. Mm, yeah. Um, it's kind of like uh, marriages this way too. Uh, read Ephesians 5. Paul says it explicitly. The people were made man and woman, and we're joined together in union and given the gift of children and, and land and all the habitation to teach us about who we are in Christ. So it's not that marriage is a picture of our relationship to Christ. Our relationship to Christ is a picture of marriage. I'm probably confusing you because I confuse myself. It, it's backfill, right? So our marriages are always incomplete and imperfect, Right? But, but they are meant to teach us, meant to teach Adam and Eve from the beginning. This is the relationship that, he, that God wants to have with his people, right? Like a holy trinity, husband, wife, children, all together. Okay, anyway. So it's all fulfilled, right? Not one jot or one tittle will pass. Oh, I, sorry, I didn't go back to the. Let's go back to where we were here. Not one jot or tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. All right, now there are some things that happen in the law that we no longer do, right? Think like ceremonial law, right? Even, even ritual, right? We, do we sacrifice the blood of bulls and goats in, in church? I, I laughed about it this morning because I was looking at the ring around the collar on my vestment, but then I'm like, but their vestments are covered in blood, so mine's not that dirty. Wait, what do we complain about? Dorothy, Dorothy, she's done. Don't, you're not going to go walking? All right, as long as she's not distracting. All right, so yeah, um, vestments. We still wear vestments, but we don't have to wear the same ones. Um, sacrifices, those, are those gone? They are, right? Because Jesus has fulfilled them, right? Their purpose was to point to Christ, and now that Christ has come, he is our sacrifice once and for all, right? Um, Circumcision is that way too. I like, I mean, we can't understand circumcision until Christ comes. And they're like, oh, I get it. Salvation comes. That's the point of salvation. I won't say any more. Conception of a, of a child? Okay, all right, fine. That's what he was, te- he was teaching. And now we understand it. And of course, we're circumcised. We're marked as God's children now by baptism. All right. So some things do change, but um, they have their correspondence in the Old Testament. And then the Old Testament still has something to teach us insofar as they teach us of Christ, all right, which is hopefully all of it. Oh, I guess she's happy now. The people are back. Oh, wait a minute. I, I just talked to you all about the stuff you see at the bottom. Oops. Yeah, it's all there. Yeah, but like Passover is a good example, right? And they use the Passover. The blood is sprinkled on the doorposts and the lentil, or painted, actually, painted on, and then the angel of death passes over, Right? And the, and the firstborn sons are saved, right? Which is, why preserve the firstborn sons of Israel? 
That's right, for the sake of the promise, for the sake of Christ, the firstborn son, right? Only born son of Mary, uh, at the beginning anyway. Firstborn son. Yeah, that's a controversial question. I don't want to get into that. So, hey, guys, stop distracting me. Then, uh, oh, Jesus is our Passover lamb, right? Jesus feeds us with unleavened bread. Uh, Jesus, we actually sing this in a couple of hymns. He paints the doorpost of our heart. Actually says that in the hymn. So that faith looks to him, death passes or, actually is the way the line goes. To God, dun, 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 dun. I'm trying to remember which hymn it is now. To God alone be glory or something is how the end of the stanza goes. Faith looks to it, death passes or, right? To the blood that he pours upon our heart. Right, so we understand that now is the angel of death passes over us too in, because we have been washed in Jesus' blood. Got it? So that now the Passover makes sense. Uh, what else? I don't know. Wearing a belt fastened around your feet. I, let's not break it down too much. All right, it says as much there. That's good. All right, so we'll do a couple more things then we'll go. Law, you shall not kill. Jesus' fulfillment You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. Yeah, if they get caught, right? But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. Whoever says to his brother, Raka, or moron, uh, idiot, I don't know, whatever, shall be in danger of the council, but whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. All right, and then he talks about being reconciled to your brother. We don't have to get into that. All right, so Jesus' fulfillment is, he's looking for something far more than just that simple obedience that you don't kill each other. He wants something better for us than that. I mean, that's great. That's a good first step, (laughs) right? That brothers aren't even angry with each other. They don't even call each other names, right? This is why parents and teachers alike, I was like, don't call don't call people names, right? Jesus said to it. That's not good. All right. Um, sacrifice a lamb for the forgiveness of sins. That one's not too hard. We don't even have to go to John chapter 1. That's John the Baptist. Behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And who is he pointing to? Yeah, Jesus is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So there, all those Passover lambs we heard about uh, with uh, Hezekiah this week, how many were there? Oh, it was an obscene number, right? Wasn't it like 10,000, 7,000, 10,000? Can you imagine? I always think, not only are the priests all covered in blood, but the place had to smell horrible. You have all the, animal blood doesn't smell great. And the, I'm sorry, Germans who like to eat things with blood in it. And then, but then all those animals outside the gates, you know, just think of the pens and the stalls that surrounded. And, you know, they leave things on the ground. <laughs> Oh, yeah, imagine when it's warm. I saw it snowed in Israel. That's, oh, and flies. Oh, oh, this is a messy affair. Yeah. God called Abraham to be the father of many. Hmm. Do you know that we studied John 8, but it's been a long time. Some of you were here for that. Abraham's offspring? Yeah, good call. Here we go. It is my Father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if you say, I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. Or if I say, but I do, not, I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. All right, so what is Jesus saying? Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He's seen it. And he's... And he saw it and was glad. If Jesus is the day that Abraham's looking forward to, what is Jesus saying? Jesus is the answer of the promises made to Abraham. Abraham was looking forward, right, to the offspring who would save many, to the great number of people that would be saved. Jesus is saying that day is now fulfilled in, not me personally, although I do have 10 children, but a multitude. <laughs> no, it's fulfilled in Jesus, right? 
So Abraham was looking forward to the day of Christ's coming, right? So the fulfillment is that Jesus now, now, we understand the promise made to Abraham. It's not that he had a great number of earthly children, which he did, right? 12 tribes and all that with, through Jacob. But the promise is fulfilled in the birth of the son, the offspring, Christ, as Paul reminds us, by offspring he meant one. And that offspring then bears many children in faith, right? All who are named children of God. Those, that is the multitude that, they have, that are more than the stars of heaven and the sand of the seashore. He's talking about the church. That's what Jesus is telling us. So when you read now the story about Abraham, read it as Jesus says it's fulfilled, right? As, a, as fulfilled in the church and his gathering of the nations to himself. So it changes the way you read the Old Testament, right? People ask sometimes, well, why, why, are the, why aren't the Jews believe in Jesus? Because you have to hear the words of Jesus. And then, then you realize what Jesus does is it's like, it's like you've been looking at everything with cloudy glasses <laughs> and then you, f- then you finally get the LASIK surgery, you know, and you're like, whoa, no, that didn't work for me. Maybe it worked for you, right? Or cataracts. Cataracts is a good example, right? Yeah, you get the cataracts done and then it's like, you know, I was thinking of Barb, right? She, when she had her surgery done and then there's no more glasses even. I'm like, you don't even look like the same person anymore. No. I don't know if any of those surgeries would work for me, but. All right, Moses raised a bronze serpent to save Israel from punishment. All right. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. That's, that's, the con- that's John. So John 3.16, the context is the picture of Moses lifting up the serpent in the wilderness, which John is telling us, what well, Jesus is telling us by way of John, that the serpent on the pole in the wilderness was to teach us of his cross. That's why that happened. That we would look upon the cross and live just like they looked upon the serpent on the pole and they were healed. Got it? Yeah, so that fulfillment language is beautiful, isn't it? Oh, one more, one more. A high priest would sacrifice for sins. Oh, that one's really hard. Who's our high priest? Yeah, Jesus is our high priest. Uh, we did a book study on the book of Hebrews. I don't know, how long did that take? Oh, look, it changed it to Herb instead of Hebrew. Okay, it's because it's set to the wrong. No, I got to turn off the like spell check on this. Okay, well, anyway, Hebrew 8. We'll just read it. Now, this is the main point of the things we, we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. All right. If you don't understand Leviticus, read Hebrews. If you want to understand Hebrews, go read Leviticus. <laughs> oh, they're dependent on each other. Same thing happens with Revelation. You can't read Revelation without re- reading Ezekiel. They go together. Like, oh, really? Yeah. You can't read it alone. You read it alone, you're like, this is wonky and it's weird. And then you end up with a whole series of books back there that are complete nonsense. They're fun fiction, but yeah. Fan fiction. <laughs> All right, anyway. All right. Oh, there's Transfiguration, Matthew 17. Oh, it's Matthew 17. It's Luke 9. That's why I was confused before. Everybody knows where the Transfiguration is, right? It's in Matthew 17. You'll hear that next week. But now I think you'll understand a little bit better. This was a good lead-in, right? Moses and the prophets. What does it mean that he fulfilled them? All right. Any questions? Jesus died on the cross. That's right. That is the whole point of the Bible from the beginning. Yeah. I was thinking about um, one of the things that's really hard to understand is like Jesus Jesus caused the windstorm to arise against Jonah. Did you catch that? Right? Um, Who who actually said to uh, Adam and Eve that that, that their life would be terrible as a result of their sin? Yeah. But it wasn't to hurt and harm them, but it was to take away anything that they might trust in that isn't him. That's what he does. That's, I could have said that at the end. I could have said that. I can always rewrite sermons after the fact, but it's too bad. Yeah. No, he, ter- he takes away anything that gets in the way of, of him. Right? Anything that you trust in. Your stuff, your life, your health, right? The weather, uh, I don't know. Anything. Right? So that you pray and you, and you study his word and you trust in him. All right, very good. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about uh, transfiguration next week, but not the prophets. Oh.
We didn't do prophets yet. Prophets is next week, right? Yeah. We need to talk about what prophecy is because I think people are a little confused about that too. Yeah. All right, good. Let's close with prayer then. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have revealed your son Jesus to us um, by way of uh, the books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. We ask that uh, you would, by your spirit, uh, give us eyes to see and ears to hear Christ uh, through all of these texts, that we would believe in him and be saved. In Jesus' name, amen.